Hosanna, a fellowship of Christians. friends it's christmas eve morning i'm coming to wearing my um one of my favorite christmas sweaters i call it my where's waldo sweater <laughs> if you're familiar with the, the the books of waldo and you're trying to find him and I, I do that on purpose because it's christmas eve but also because christmas sometimes can be like looking for waldo and the flurry of everything else that's going on and the ways that people have interpreted finding the true meaning of christmas sometimes gets lost and we christians bemoan that sometimes but we fall into the same trap sometimes and it's not just that christ was born although that is that's the event that we're here to celebrate and that tonight of course will be the particular time when we we observe uh, that, that what happened in history but the reason that he was born is what matters most and the video that we just saw reminds us of that reason that ultimately it is about god's love for us for god so loved the world of the world that he gave his only begotten son it's the core verse of our christian faith coming from the mouth of jesus himself she remind me a little bit of Juliet of norwich she lived in the 1300, 600 and some years ago and long before our time. But there was a there was a point in her life when she had a revelation of Jesus. He showed up for her uh, personally in a way that really mattered to him, to her. And um, she had some questions to ask. And uh, this is kind of a famous quotation from her. She says, what's the meaning of all this? And this is a response she got. What? Do you wish to know the Lord's meaning in all of us? Well, know it well. Love was his meaning. And that who reveals it to you? Love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why does he reveal it to you? For love. Remain in this, and you will know more of the same, but you will never know different. So I was taught that love is our Lord's meaning, and I saw very certainly in this and in everything that before God made us, he loved us which love was never abated and never shall be. And maybe that's the most important thing that we can remember on a day like today. We're sorry not able to be with you in person, hopefully. However, this uh, this time that we spend together online will be very helpful to you. We have some uh, some a message to give to you that follows up with this. It's based upon love. It was a message we actually gave several years ago. Uh, you may remember bits and pieces of it, but hopefully it's an encourage if you saw it before. And if you haven't, that, that that's a cool too. But maybe encourage you in your own journey as you're seeking to remember how deeply and how wonderfully God loves you. Um, Jesus said so. And this I know, where the Bible tells me so. Blessings on you all on this beautiful day. Amen. Yeah, and it is an extraordinary thing that God did, isn't it? Choosing to leave the perfect peace of heaven and come into this imperfect and anything but peaceful world, not as a powerful divine ruler, but as a vulnerable human baby. Extraordinary thing. But why would God do such a thing? Well, as G Jesus so clearly told Nicodemus, the reason is also extraordinary. God came to be one of us for love of us. Let's read the familiar story from Luke's gospel. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. I was thinking about this passage as we were singing that earlier. The glory of the Lord is all around us. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for 
all the people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning, woo, sorry it's about that, my screen just went crazy. Uh, they spread the word concerning the, uh, what they'd been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The world God came into then is much like our world today, isn't it? It's a world with no room. No room at the inn for tired travelers in need of rest. No room in our noisy rushing for any quiet pondering of so many doubts and questions. No room in our overcrowded calendars to respond to unscheduled divine invitations. No room in our hurting hearts for any patient waiting on the new life that is already being born right now in the most unnoticed places of our lives and our world. Now, like then, we're a world with no room for God. And yet, it is into that world, into this world, that God so loves that Jesus came and continues to come to those who are willing to make room for him. He doesn't come primarily to exceptional people. He does, because he wants everyone to know him. But he doesn't primarily come to the exceptional ones, to the, the famous, the intellectual, the wealthy, the powerful, or even the overly religious. God comes primarily to ordinary people, like inexperienced young Mary, and Carp Carpenter Joseph, who was just your average blue collar laborer, and dirty shepherds working the graveyard shift out in the fields with their flocks expecting nothing more unusual than an occasional shooting star. But suddenly, these ordinary folks experienced something extraordinary, an angelic light show that illuminated the night sky as they were given some astonishingly, astonishingly good news. He, that's the word I can't pronounce today. Astonishing good news. God is here. God is with us. And he hasn't come only for the special people. God's come for you. I remember what it felt like the first time I realized that someone that I thought was really special actually felt the same way about me. It was in junior high. That was a long time ago. At least three or four years. Yes. Nothing came of it, except that whenever we saw each other in the hall, between classes, I mean, we really saw each other. Our eyes met and we smiled and experienced that wonder of being special enough to be seen like that by that very special someone. Now, magnify that by infinity. And we may just catch a glimpse of the way Mary and Joseph and those shepherds felt when they realized that the most special person of all, God, really saw them and loved them, them. And God still sees and still loves unwed pregnant mothers and ordinary blue collar laborers and tired, hopeless third shift workers. The angel's message was incredibly good news for them, and it still is for us. Because no matter how ordinary or insignificant you may see yourself, 
This may be the day when you catch God gazing at you in the hallway. This may be the day, this may actually be the moment when you experience the wonder of realizing just how unique and special you really are to God, the most special someone of all. In fact, the Bible says that even before God laid the foundations of the world, he saw you. Right? We read it. Psalm 139. He saw you. He knew every detail about you before you were ever born. He, every hair on your head, every thought in your mind, every feeling you would ever have in your heart. God knew every good thing you would ever do and also knew every sin you would ever commit. And still chose to tenderly form you in your mother's womb anyway, because why? You have never been out of God's sight. Ever. You've never been out of God's heart. Ever. See, the good news of Christmas is that God loves ordinary you and comes to be with you in all the ordinary places of your life. Because God not only sees you, listen, God seeks you. God pursues you in love. We talked about that last week, David, Psalm 23. God pursues you all the days of your life. God's love is chasing you down. So whether we're aware of it or not, yeah, the glory of the Lord shines all around us wherever we are, just as we are, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our cars, even in all of our filthy stables. See, God seeks and finds us where we least expect it, right? Right now, we have a lot of people who are sick. They've got a variety of things happening and COVID and everything else. But God's seeking and finding them. Not just those of us here gathered in this, this room together, which is wonderful, but those who want to be here and can't. God seeks and finds us where we least expect it, like in the illness that's exhausting the strength of so many people. Right there in the relationship you think is dead. In the job that seems to be going nowhere. In the grief of every loss of your life. And wonder of wonders, here's some more good news. This is not only true for you, or for me, or for Tony. This is true for everyone, everyone on the face of this earth, everyone who has ever lived. For God so loved the whole world. God so loved the whole world that the Savior has come for the love of all of us because we wouldn't come to him. So he came to us as a vulnerable baby lying in a manger, and inside that tiny baby beat the heart of God. And that heart has never stopped beating, never stopped longing for every single one of us, for all of us. And it beats with a love that will not let us go. I used to sing that song here. God came to us as a baby so we might come close to him and love him in return. No fear, no smiting, no. If you've never prayed with the Christmas story where you allow yourself in your godly imagination to be there and ask Mary if you can hold him, please do that. Pray that prayer. To hold God in your own arms and realize there's nothing to fear. And then you get to experience the reality that real love, it has to go both ways. Real love goes both ways. That idea of God coming as a baby has been more meaningful to me this year than mm -hmm. it has been for a long time. Yes. I get to be a grandfather for the first time this year. I was holding yeah. my grandson yesterday for quite a while. Love coming in the form of a baby? Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I look in his little eyes and, um, and um, I can see um, mm -hmm. why God did it that way. Yeah. Well, think for, for a moment. By the time that you received a gift that just blew you away,
Perhaps it was under a Christmas tree, perhaps not. Just something that you said, wow! And it's one of those gifts that you remember. For me as a teenager, it was my first car. <laughs> it wasn't even entirely a gift. I, I paid a whole $250 for it. Uh, <laughs> but it was my cousin's car, and so I got the discounted rate, and it was entirely unexpected. I didn't think I'd be able to have a car. As I said the other week, my family we didn't have much money, so the idea that I could be driving around in my own vehicle was mind-blowing to me. And this was even better. It was a cool car. <laughs> I was not cool. This car improved my cool quotient about three times. Uh, I'm sure there's at least a few of you in the room that would appreciate what a 69 Chevy Malibu SS meant to a boy in 1983. Uh, <laughs> Mine didn't look like that. <laughs> that, by the way, is available for sale these days at $38,000. That's, uh, that's the sale price attached to that one. I wish I had held on to my $250 one. <laughs> Mine actually was paint a lot. It had two pink, pink colors on it. One of them was that. Uh, the other one was my favorite pink color, primer. Uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite a bit of it. <laughs> It was jacked up in the back. The muffler was shot full of holes. Uh, and man, it, it was loud. It was, that baby was loud. It goes through a quart of oil about a, every 15 minutes. Uh, is, that, is that what started your hearing issues? <laughs> <laughs> it even had an 8-track player. Oh with 8-tracks come in. So there was, my cousin had left in Roberta Flack, Feel Like Making Love, and I was 18 and I wasn't sure what she was talking about. But, <laughs> so I'm driving around in my 69 Chevy. Uh, the girl I was interested in at the time laughed at the car when I <laughs> to take her somewhere. Literally laughed. But I didn't mind because she got in anyway. <laughs> I was so grateful for this automobile that I told God I would make it available for others to use if they needed. I, I, I didn't deserve this. I didn't expect this. I, I shouldn't be able to have this. So I, it was good for me spiritually. I gave lots of people rides. I even allowed my friends to drive it. Hey, take the keys. They need to go to a job interview or a doctor's appointment or something. The gift of this extraordinary thing caused me uh, who I was a, quite a shy, introverted guy at the time, caused me to want to bless others. Mm -hmm. And that's a small bit of what happens when we encounter for the first time the extraordinary fact that God so loved the world and that that love includes me. Mm -hmm. Because for love of God, we turn our attention horizontally to the brokenness of the world and are motivated to act, to do something about it, to give to others at least some of what's been given to us. We might say it this way, God came and now we go. Mm -hmm. We go to where the needs are. We go to people who are stuck in the same stuff we were stuck in before Christ came and set us free. We go to the friends and family around us and try to do what we can do to help with what they need. At this stage of faith, we realize, even if we don't have the words or the theology, even if we never get the words or the theology behind it, that we are now the incarnation of Christ in the world. Yep. We are Christ's body. We are Christ's hands. We are Christ's feet. And just like Christ came to serve us, so we want to return the favor and serve God by serving others. Many of you know what I'm feeling, what I'm talking about here. You felt that. You feel that now. Mm -hmm. This stage of faith is a good one. A necessary one even. But contrary to what many Christians think, it's not the end goal. You see, at this stage, we're motivated by gratitude, yes, mm -hmm. but also by duty, by dutiful obedience to God. Yeah. At this stage, we do an awful, we talk an awful lot, what I see sometimes in my, the papers that my students at a seminary give me, all about the commandments of God, what Jesus commanded us to do. And we try to motivate ourselves and others to do what we're told to do. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of those kind of papers. At this stage, we're focused on doing. Because doing seems to be the only way we could love God back for the gift that he's given us. And so we do, and we do, and we do. And all this is good. Don't stop doing. We're doing what we've been taught to do to reciprocate one kindness for another. And maybe there's nothing we can do for God, but there are things that we could do for the people God loves. We want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. 
But there often comes a time when we're in this mode, when we realize that we've worn ourselves out by our do-gooding. We feel fatigue and frustrations. Frustrations that others aren't joining in like we expected them to. That not they're responding to our acts of service. So we responded to God's gift. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever look around and say, man, I wish those people would care as much as I do? See, this is where many believers, some believers at least, just quit. Mm -hmm. I've tried. I've done everything I can do. It's not working. They walk away from the faith or they sit down on their butts and say, I tried to love God back and I can't seem to do enough or to do it right. I'm tired. Let someone else take over now. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that this hyperactive way of serving the world out of love for God is not the entirety of what God had in mind for us. That God so loved the world in a better way than even this. And invites us to do our good things in the world differently. Yeah. And perhaps for a different reason. Yeah, so the good news of Christmas is that God came for love of us so that we might live for love of God. But not living for love of God, as Tony just said, by exhausting ourselves in some dutiful attempt, attempt to repay God for what God's done for us. You know, by going out and serving him in the world that he loves. It's far more than that. It's about us receiving, yes, that free gift, the unmerited grace of Jesus, who that's the gift. He's the gift that, that God gave because he so loved the whole world and everyone in it, including every one of us. And when we receive that gift of Christ into our hearts, our hearts are so transformed by his love. We find ourselves empowered rather than exhausted. That is a way to discern where are you in your spiritual growth? Where are you? By discerning, where am I in loving? Am I exhausted because I just feel like I have to do, as Tony just said, so much for God in the world, in my own strength, in my own power, and I can't do it? If that's where you are and you're ready to be done, so many people right now are there. So many Christians are there right now. Done. I'm done. I'm done. The idea is don't walk away, just notice what's happening because you are right on the threshold of growing into the completion, the fullness. We're rather you know, than living exhausted, we live empowered. We're not doing things in our own strength but in the strength of God where we don't have to, we get to, we get to partner with him. In this world, he so loves because miracle of miracles, we actually find ourselves loving it too. And I think we're positioned here as a world coming into Christmas this week to receive again the gift of this grace that sets us free and empowers us to love even those that we would not normally love. And then what we do, we find ourselves longing to give our lives away, like Jesus did for love of all. As we said earlier, right, real love has to go both ways. It begins by receiving God's love and loving God back. That's that two way, you know, and that's where it all starts and really wanting to do something for God in the world. But this way of loving is incomplete if we're only serving others for love of God. Jesus was clear, our love relationship with God is made complete as we grow in loving others, right? So it's this way, um, can I do that at the same time? That's like doing this, right? Our love is made complete as we grow in loving others as God has loved us. Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Jesus said, this is what fulfills it all. Just, I know you're tired. Just focus on two things. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
There's no greater commandment than these. And then elsewhere, Jesus made it abundantly clear what this love actually looks like. And I like it in the message version. So let's read from here, from, this is in Matthew 5. You're familiar with the old written law. Love your friend and its unwritten companion. Hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you, this is commanding. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. There's a thought. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer. For then you're working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm, and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless the good and bad, the nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, what do you expect, a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. Grow up, church. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. God loves you and the whole world, right? We saw that. So guess what? We get to love God and the whole world too. No exceptions. Isn't this the greatest good news of all? There are no exceptions. We are free now to live and to love as Jesus did because, and, and what Tony said earlier, this, this needs repeating. The moment we give our lives and our love to him and receive his life and his love in return through the Holy Spirit, God, who comes to dwell within us and joins God's spirit with our human spirit and makes us one spirit with the Lord. The moment that happens, we literally become reincarnations of Jesus in this world. We become Jesus with skin on. We trade our life for his life and he's now living here through us. That's the greatest good news of all. It's not in our own power. It's not in our own strength. It's by his spirit, says the Lord. Reincarnations. This is something I, I'll, I'll often, sometimes I like to poke at students, right? And they'll come in and be going off about all of this reincarnation talk and Eastern religion and all of this. And I said, actually, that, that's not really the point, is it? The point is, you're a reincarnation. You're reincarnated. And they're like, what? And it's just kind of fun. It's like, well, is Jesus alive in you? You died. He lives in you. Reincarnated, all it means is embodied. So much fun. First John 4 allows no doubt about this. We're, we're preaching this out of the scriptures. First John 4, God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us. In other words, this is how love is made complete. This is not just the beginning. This is the fullness. So we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. Why? Because Jesus is here. Because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. I have loved this scripture. I, I always say that. Maybe someone can go through all of you know, 25 years or so of preaching messages and hear when I say, that's my favorite. No, oh, that's my favorite. No, this is my favorite today. This is one you talk an awful lot I about. I do, because it's what is reality. And if we would just get this, folks, just wake up and realize this is what's real. All that Jesus now is. And how is Jesus now? Students, anyone have an answer? How is Jesus now? I think he has a cold, he's feeling a little under the weather. No. Although he's not enjoying COVID 
<laughs> inside of people who, who have it, I'm sure, but how is Jesus now, folks? He's alive. He's resurrected. Right? Seated in Glorified. heavenly places in Christ. He's seated in the Trinity right now, and he's seated in us. All that Jesus now is in his seated, risen self in heaven, resurrected from the dead, is now in us. All that Jesus now is, so are we. Where? In heaven after we die? Yeah, that'll be true. That's not the point. We don't need this then. All that Jesus now is, so are we. In this world that God so loved. Do you see it? And John goes on. Our love for others. Our love for others then is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. It's not just words. It's not just emotion. God demonstrated this love by what? Coming and taking on a body so we could be like him. He's like us, so we can be like him. Anyone can say, I love you, or I love God. Anyone can say, I love God, yet have hatred toward another believer. No raise of hands. This makes him a phony. Because if you don't love a brother or sister whom you can see, how can you truly love God whom you can't? For he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others. So for love of all, God came from eternity to be bound in time with us. For love of all, God came from immortality to be bound in human flesh with us. And for love of all, God went from a crib to be bound to a cross for us. God's extraordinary love is stronger than any sin anyone has ever committed. It's deeper than any pain anyone has ever endured. It is higher than any hope anyone has ever imagined. And it is wider than all the cracks in every broken heart in this world. And listen, because all of this is true. This is true. Together in shared love, this, this is the gift. We now get to be Jesus with skin on in this world that God so loves. We get to be his hands and his feet and his heart and his hope and his peace and his joy as we demonstrate God's love to all in this world. So amen, hallelujah, I right? Like this is awesome. Yes, yeah, you got it, Gordon. This is the this most is real. basic gospel message this morning, isn't it? God sees us. God loves us. We can love God back. And then we get to love others the way God loves us. Yep. This is the good news. This is what changes the world. And yet, why aren't we dancing? <laughs> why aren't we up on our feet? <laughs> Even though this is preached year after year, we do it in one form or another. Yeah. Decade after decade. This is my 37th Christmas as a pastor. Century after century. In the 2,000 years that the church has been in existence, it seems sometimes that we're no closer to the renewal, restoration, and redemption of all things as God has intended. Yeah. There's a reason Charlie Brown is depressed, and there's a reason sometimes those of us who love God get a little bit out of sorts this time of the year. Where is the proof? Why isn't this happening? And by the way, it'd be easy for somebody like me to get judgmental. Been preaching this year after year after year. Why aren't you people paying attention? Until I realize that there are the moments when I'm not paying attention and I'm not living out. One of the most haunting carols we sing each Christmas, one of the ones I love that we sing, is one by Longfellow, wrote the words, Henry Wadsworth, the, the poet, who heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and loud and sweet their songs repeat of what? Peace, Peace on, on earth, earth, goodwill to men. And women. Yes. <laughs> Longfellow was 
<laughs> patriarch. Yes. yes. That's okay. But Longfellow didn't just let that rest there because there was a discontent within him, the same one I just expressed. And he lamented in response. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks a song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. He was writing this, by the way, in the middle of the Civil War. Yeah. That was 160 years ago, and that lament is still true. I felt it particularly this year. So what do we do about that? Well, maybe we can't bring peace to the whole world or goodwill to all of humankind. But we can acknowledge what it is that often keeps us from loving all in our own little corner of the world. Yeah. For doing, for being in the world. The body and the, the, the hands and the feet of Christ, as Joanne was just talking about. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, a Charlie Brown Christmas gives, a, gives us a powerful clue about how to do that. Charlie Brown is wondering what the true meaning of Christmas is. And as I said, Linus responds by telling the story. He recites that Luke 2 passage that we read to you near the beginning of this message. Now, you remember Linus, don't you? He's the one, usually with the thumb in his mouth, mm -hmm. and with his security blanket held tightly in his arms. Always, always with the security blanket. Well, with one exception. For halfway through telling how God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Linus drops his blanket. Yeah. <laughs> Is that like a drop mic? Kind of drop blanket. Yeah. yeah. It's an amazing, it's, it, it's an overlooked part of this, but it was done very intentionally. He drops it right when he recites those words that the angel sang to the shepherds. Fear not. Yeah. And the blanket lies in a heap on the floor through the remainder of his recitation. Yeah. And then later in the show, he wraps it around Charlie Brown's yes. sad Christmas tree. Yes. You see the point? Linus doesn't need a security blanket anymore. Fear not! For one has come with a perfect love to deliver us from all fear. The fear of believing that such love is possible. The fear of receiving that love. The fear of relieving the fears of others whom we would dare love. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to keep us, nothing to hold us back anymore from loving as God loves. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do the same thing? There is nothing left to fear, especially God himself. For God so loved the world, Jesus told Nicodemus. Remember what the rest of that part is? You know John 3, 16 perhaps. How about verse 17? Yeah. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Hallelujah. But to save the world through him. God's love is not scary. And that means that loving God and then loving everyone else, loving all, isn't scary either. Not anymore. His love is already in us, naturally flowing through of us, through us and out of us into a love-starved world. Yeah. If we let it. Yeah. So let me close by asking, will we? What security blanket might the Holy Spirit be inviting you to let go of today? Something you're holding on to that you don't need anymore. Something that represents the fear that's keeping you from living out this love in the way that you've already been given. Already yeah. empowered to do. How would dropping our own blankets free our hearts and hands to, to reach out to everyone in our world? We don't have to hold on anymore. We can reach out with our hands to everyone in our own little world who feels a bit like that Charlie Brown Christmas tree. We can even wrap... God's freeing, healing, peace-giving love around them this Christmas. Yes. All of them. Mm -hmm. No exceptions. No exceptions. Let's pray about that. Mm -hmm. Father, as we pause for prayer, may your spirit nudge each one of us to identify the security blankets in our lives the fears that hold us back from loving. 
the mistaken ideas that keep us from understanding who we really are in you. Mm -hmm. The sin and brokenness that tempts us into believing we don't want, really want to love after all. Maybe we're not going to change the world this Christmas, but whether your love has changed everything if we believe it and we want to believe it and live like it's true. Give us the courage to do that this time around. As we pray in your name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Longfellow wasn't done, by the way. He wrote another verse. Mm -hmm. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. And women. <laughs> Merry Christmas. We'll see you on Christmas Eve. <laughs>